Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Horace, and I am so excited to welcome you all to More Than School Fireside Chat, powered by RISE. We call this event More Than School because now more than ever, haven't we seen that school is just well, so much more? It's more than tests and books and desks. Public schools have always been a place, I would call it a refuge really, uh, for warm meals, warm clothes, warm hugs. Our school communities are really so much more thanks to the efforts of our heroic and passionate educators and leaders like the ones we're speaking to today. I get the chance now everyone to introduce you to a colleague of mine, Dr. Don Coberly. He is the recently retired superintendent of Boise Public Schools after serving a whopping 38 years as a public school educator. Uh, very excited to join, um, for, to have him join as the current CEO of RISE Treasure Valley Education Partnership. So Don, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Danielle. Um, just a little bit about RISE for those of you who don't know. We are a nonprofit that's devoted to promoting uh, public education uh, both in the Treasure Valley and uh, across the state of Idaho. And we are fortunate today to have two guests, um, both superintendents. Um, one is Wendy Johnson, who's the superintendent in the CUNA School District, and then my successor in Boise, Superintendent uh, Kobe, Kobe Dennis. So welcome, you guys. Hi. Hi, Don. Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity. Sure thing. So, you know, let's let's start off this way. Um, would, the, would the two of you talk just a little bit? We'll start with you, Wendy. Talk a little bit about your background in education. How'd you get into education? Where'd you grow up? Blah, blah, blah. How'd you, did you ever think you were going to become a, a superintendent of a public school district? Kind of just generally your background. Oh, yeah. I'll try to be succinct, um, which I'm not always known for, but um, my parents were both educators and um, I grew up helping my mom in her kindergarten or fourth grade classroom. Um, my dad was a chemistry teacher at Boise High, and I have pictures of myself, you know, in his classroom as a, as a young person. And every time I go into some of our chemistry classrooms here in CUNA, I always like the smell, you know, they have a smell about them and it just takes me back to um, growing up with my parents um, as educators. Um, I was going to become a poet, um, and my mom, out of good motherly wisdom, suggested I get an education degree just in case that poetry thing didn't work out. And um, I had I'd done some work um, with some youth um, in in an elementary school and in a high school, and my mom was right. Um, she she got me the right direction in, in working with kids and I just loved it. So I was, I started my career in 93 as an English teacher out here in CUNA School District and um, taught English, taught journalism, taught theater, taught speech, taught pretty much anything that needed to be taught, you know, in that ELA world. Um, and then I, I took a, a short kind of break um, from educating um, students and I started working with teachers and um, administrators and helping them with getting their technology certification and um, teaching problem-based learning strategies and some of those sorts of things for a different organization. Um, and, and then I came back to uh, working in curriculum, um, working with administrators primarily, working with teachers, um, came back to the, the CUNA School District in 2005 and I never ever thought I would be uh, a superintendent. Um, in fact, my dad was one of the people who started the teachers union back in the day in Boise School District. And uh, he, uh, you know, back in those days, you know, administrators were kind of the enemy. And so I, I was actually kind of afraid when I got my administrative certificate that my parents were gonna disown me, you know, but things have changed a lot since back in those days, you know, we. We are not enemies. We work together um, to help kids. So uh, that's kind of my crazy, crazy connection. And actually, my family has a connection with Kobe's because my dad and Kobe's grandfather actually worked together um, at, at Boise, Boise High School. So um, my dad loves the Dennis's. I'll say that. I'll turn it over to you, Kobe. How's that? So, Wendy, how long have you been the superintendent in CUNA? 
Um, this is my eighth year as eight a years. superintendent. And I served, let's see, uh, I guess eight years prior to that as the assistant superintendent. Okay. So you you worked for Jay Hummel out there. I did. Yeah. He's the one who told me to to go down. Actually, he didn't tell me. He just made me kind of experience it. And then when he was retired, he said, this is yours. You should do this. And I, I never thought that would be where I would be. I thought I'd be a really good just kind of assistant and helper. And, yeah. and I'm glad he invested in me um, to make me uh, believe I could do it. Sometimes the job finds you. Yeah. 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 And you grew up in, in the Treasure Valley, didn't you? I grew up in uh, good old Emmett. I know. Oh. Small little community. We, um, you know, we, a place where you didn't lock your doors and you could stay out all night as a young kid. And um, I, I grew up there, graduated from there, had amazing teachers. Um, I When I went enrolled in, in college, man, it was easy for me because of the work that, that my educators, you know, the educators in my life have done. So right, right. shout out to Emmett. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> So, Kobe, I know your family has a has a long background in education as well. Can you talk a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, yeah, um, I am actually a fourth generation educator here in Idaho. Uh, my great grandmother uh, was a teacher in Hagerman, Idaho. Um, and then um, Wendy talked about my grandfather being a, uh, a teacher here. He was a small uh, district superintendent for a number of years and, and ended his career as the assistant principal at Boise High School, where he got to work directly with Wendy's father. Um, so yeah, so and then my dad um, uh, was a superintendent here in the Boise School District. And and now I have uh, had the opportunity to do the same thing. So, um, you know, I grew up here in Boise, um, went to school, I went to Jackson Elementary School, Maple Grove Elementary School, uh, Amity Elementary School. The first year the old building was open. Um, so I got to experience that and then South Junior High, Bora High School, and then um, went off to the University of Idaho, uh, came back and um, uh, and then started teaching, uh, taught math in this district for a number of years. I taught every grade level seven through 12, um, did some coaching uh, on the side at, at Bora and North Junior High School. Um, and then uh, then had the opportunity to get into administration and um, was a school level administrator for uh, about nine years, 10 years, and then um, got the opportunity to come up here and, and work with you, Don, um, directly as uh, my boss and became the deputy superintendent and then uh, uh, the superintendent. And like Wendy, never, ever thought of myself in the context of uh, being a superintendent. It just, it wasn't really anything that I even aspired to do. Um, mm. And to Don, to your point, sometimes the job finds you. Mm -hmm. um, when you decided to retire, then you you did a lot to encourage me to um, to do this. Um, and, and so here we are, um, almost, I'm, this is my 30th year in education. And um, I and so it's it's amazing um, to think that that much time has passed and changes we've seen over my 30 years. I and and not to, to sidetrack, but just to illustrate, my first year as a teacher in the Boise School District, we didn't even have telephones in our classrooms. I remember that. Yeah. Um, and so it uh, to think about where we are today. Um, with the computers and the technology that we have um, in comparison to the fact that uh, in order to call a parent back uh, in the evenings, I had to go down to the faculty room and and in order to call a parent after school. So that's right. Amazing. That's right. That's a, and I remember when uh, we got air conditioning. Yeah. In the schools. I mean, there's a oh. period of time where we didn't have air conditioning in any of our schools. None of them. None of yeah. them. Yep. You're crazy. Well, so um, this is your second year? Second year. Yep. Time Second flies, year. Right? <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 the timing of this was perfect. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So the timing for me was perfect too. I retired in the summer of uh, 2019, right before uh, COVID hit. So, but this last year, it's been a heck of a year for you guys. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the stress that's happened, your board, how they've handled everything, where you are with it? I know you're two very optimistic people. Um, so talk a little bit about where you've been and where it's going and what you see. Kobe, you want to start? Sure. 
um, you know, it's 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 been interesting. Um, I, I talked to Lisa Roberts, my our deputy superintendent, the other day, and reminded her that um, in, in our time, in our positions, we've we've been in our positions longer during COVID than we were outside of COVID, which mm-hmm. is kind of hard to wrap your head around. We had, we had about eight months um, as in, in the superintendency uh, prior to COVID hitting. And now we've been in for almost an entire year without uh, during COVID, um, and so it's it's been an, an interesting challenge um, to say the least. And and I think probably just to kind of dig into it, I think a couple of the the big challenges that we faced is anytime um, we've had to make decisions, um, the community. And, and I'm talking whether it's legislat- legislators or local leaders or parents or teachers, um, every decision is a 50-50 split on what you should and shouldn't do. Um, and I think that has created significant challenges on how you keep your school community together yeah. as you try and navigate um, the decisions that you have to make every single day. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I would I would say that's been a real challenge is navigating fear, um, and because everything associated with COVID um, brings out fear in our in in everyone. Um, it's the fear of the unknown. It's it's institutions that you've always been able to count on being um, unstable or unsure about where you're supposed to go. Um, so I think navigating fear has been a real challenge. And then and then probably the last thing I would say, and, and then I'll let, let Wendy jump in, is this idea that's, that we have um, weaponized science. Um, and, and I think that be, that is something that has been been very concerning to me. And, I, and I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. And, and Lisa, said this in a board meeting the other day, and I think it's a really, it really does illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, we've gotten emails from parents who say, hey, please follow our the CDC guidelines and reopen our schools. Right. The very next email will say, please follow the CDC guidelines and keep our, ki- our schools closed. And so it's, it, it, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm just saying that both sides of these issues have used science to weaponize and weaponized it to make the point that they want you to make. And don't you think um, that's the fear, Kobe? I think it's 100% the fear. I think all of those things kind of build upon each other and it's what has made this a really challenging year. Hmm. Yeah. Wendy? Um, I, I'll say ditto <laughs> to what, to what Kobe said, but um, yeah, it's, we're used to pleasing people, you know, we're used to, to working through issues to get to the best solutions for our kids. And this was impossible. Um, getting to, getting to what's going to work for everybody or the, even the majority, like the 80%, boy, that was really, really hard this year. And, and I, I've said, you know, this is my 26th year in CUNA um and it, it's been the hardest year i've ever had um but but rather than reiterate what kobe's eloquently said there are some things that have helped this not be as hard one is the the sic superintendents the southern idaho conference superintendents being able to meet with people who are going through the exact same challenges talking through them brainstorming, getting Mm -hmm. ideas, um, helping each other has been huge. Um, And it it did, because this, you know, superintendency sometimes can be very lonely. Um, Mm -hmm. You're the boss and um, you can't tell your worries to other people. You got to kind of keep those to yourself because you got to be strong, you know? And so having colleagues that get it, it's really important. Um, Our board has been awesome. They've been you know, tight. They've been, you know, following the science, trying to find solutions, working through things. Um, They helped each other. Um, 
you know, they've been amazing um, to, to lean in on as well. Um, and, you know, our internal team has just been fabulous. You know, my, my team in this office, our, our principals have worked so hard um, navigating this because they're in, char- they're in charge of making sure learning still happens and it's safe. Right. Um, regardless of what mode we're in. And that's a lot. That's been a lot of, mm-hmm. of heavy lifting on their their side of things. They've been amazing. And our teachers and staff. Um, and then I would also add our community. I mean, even though they've been split, the kindness that we've seen has been amazing. I, I told Kobe this the other day. I had a mom call and leave a message on my voicemail and said, I just want you to know that because, you know, there's always stuff on social media about, oh, we're, we should do this or we shouldn't do this. And it's divided. And she just said, I want you to know there's a lot of us out there. We're rooting for you. We care about you. We um, you're doing a great job. We appreciate you. And I sent I made a, a copy of that um, voicemail and I sent it to my whole staff just so that they could hear it too. Wow. Yeah. Um, because they needed it. But yeah. so there, there have been some really kind people. And I think the biggest learning out of this is our communities need our schools. Mm-hmm. They need our schools. And even when somebody's angry because it's not how they need it to be for their kid, I get it. I get why. Um, they depend on us to be their partner um, yeah. in this work. So, but how are your teachers doing? I mean, you got great staffs in those two districts. Oh, we have amazing teachers, amazing staff. Um, I, I have to give kudos to our elementary teachers and staff to begin with. I mean, all of our staff's working super hard, but you know, um, our community really, we're commuter, primarily commuter community. And um, about uh, 80% of our families work outside of CUNA. And our um, families depended on us to to be a part of their solution to be able to let them, you know, be able to work. And our elementary teachers um, started in-person learning five days a week um, starting the beginning of October. They navigated, and it was it was hugely a challenge, you know, especially when there was huge spikes in cases in Ada County. They navigated all of that, um, and it was tough. So I, I got to give them a huge kudos. And on, on the other side of that, you know, kind of, we had a hybrid schedule in our secondary, um, our secondary teachers have figured out, you know, compacting curriculum. How do we, how do we make sure kids are learning still when they're not in person with us, um, on that, um, day when they're remote? Um, we've had a teacher figure out how to teach online and in person at the same time. And we're, we, we've called it, we've given it, you know, his name, which I should say, Andrew Horning, he's amazing. Um, we've called his strategy the Andrew Horning me- method in our school district now um, because of what he's, you know, people have just been so creative in figuring out how do I still help my kids learn, even though it's not the ideal situation right now. So amazing, amazing people. I'm lucky um, to work with them. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and and just to piggyback, I mean, I, I Wendy said that more eloquently than I can, but I, I think it's important for for the community to recognize just how hard our teachers have worked. Um, I mean, when, when you think about where we were a year ago, um, almost to the day from, um, from when everything kind of shut down, our teachers have had to learn how to implement technology that they may or may not have been familiar with. Mm -hmm. They had to um, figure out how to take lessons that they know have worked when kids are in school, uh, in person, and translate that to a digital format. And they've had to figure out how to keep kids engaged and motivated when um, when all it takes for a kid to do is is uh, uh, is to turn off their camera. Um, so, so that when I hear people talk, um, in the community about, well, you know, the teachers haven't even been, haven't done anything. They haven't been in session. I, I, I get angry about that because 
I don't know that we've ever had a year where where our teachers have had to work harder than what they do now. Um, and so I say all that to give some context to the fact that our teachers are doing well, but but they're they're learning. I, I we talk is in education a lot about being lifelong learners. Um, this year really put that to the test. We got to be students as well as teachers um, through this whole year. So I, I can't speak any highly, any more highly than than I do about what our teachers have been able to pull off. Yeah, it's been it's been incredible. And and you, you know something I hear being on the outside now and hearing some of the social media influences and the outside influences, it's just amazing to me that um, one of the things I was reading the other day is it's, schools are closed and yet Boise is going to give their teachers a raise and, you know, the unions are at fault and they're keeping kids out of school. And I know there was an incident over in West Ada, but it seems to me that in general, you guys as associations have worked really hard to, to keep things going. Can you speak to that? Well, uh, yeah, and, and I'll jump in and turn it over to, to Wendy. It, it, I don't know that we could have managed this without the cooperation of our association. Um, you know, whenever thing you learn about people in the hard times, not in the easy. Times. And um, and it's and our relationship with our teachers is one of the reasons that I think we've been able to carry through this. Um, our, our teachers union and our association has never one time said we can. not Not one time. Um, they've had concerns. They've the end, but they come to the table in a solution oriented manner so that we can find a path through this. Um, and, and so, yeah, it is, this isn't about the unions. This isn't about management versus unions. This is like Wendy said earlier, this has to be about the entire school community coming together in order to get to where we are. We're, we're going to start five days a week next Tuesday, and then we're going to have all of our secondary kids back the, the Monday after spring break. And it's because we've worked together that we're going to be able to do this safely. And I want to keep saying that we've wanted to do this safely. And um, and once we get there, um, everybody's all in. Wendy? Yeah, you, you did. You said exactly what I would <laughs> say as well is um, I do think that our unions in general in in the united states and in particular in idaho have been blamed for things that um it it's not their fault they didn't create covid they didn't create the, the unsafe environments and and i apologize if i'm going to be political for a moment but some of the real challenges that we had in our school district were we couldn't address some of those safety issues because of the extreme, um, the challenge that we've had for generations with funding in our school districts. Um, to be honest, I'm going to, I'm going to be very specific to a thank you to our community because we were able to, to move from, um, you know, online learning fairly quickly because our community had invested in, in devices for our, our children. If they hadn't done that, we wouldn't have been able to move as right. quickly. And, and I know that uh, some of my colleagues were just bashed for not being able to, to all of a sudden have, you know, thousands and thousands of devices to, to get out to kids. The only reason we were able to be in that position is because our local community supported it. Yeah. Um, but, but back to your real question, which was, um, <laughs> The, the relationship, it, it really, I mean, we work together in this, in this work. Um, we developed our, our, you know, reopening plan, our operational plan, our monitoring plan. We, we meet, we work together as a community, as, as teachers, as principals, as um, leaders, um, as a board to try to figure this out. It, it wasn't done um, to anybody. Now, parents may have felt that way a little bit because sometimes we weren't able to meet all their needs. You know, like I said, that's been the most challenging part of this work. 
But, um, you know, I'll, I'll give it, I'll be, I'll acknowledge for me what is going on in CUNA right now is um, our board voted to stay in hybrid for the, the rest of the school year for grade six or 12. And um, they heard teachers saying, we have serious concerns about returning. And it wasn't so much safety, it was, it, although it was safety for kids, it was more about consistency for kids. Mm. And we've been in hybrid since the start of the school year. Um, and we heard from parents that are like, hey, I like this, it's working, we don't want another change, we're used to this, our kids mm -hmm. are finally in a routine, they're able to experience things. But then we've also heard from parents that are angry. And so we're, we're since that vote happened, we're actually at the table with a mixed group of people. We have teachers at the table, we have moms and dads at the table, mm -hmm. we have leaders at the table that are trying to figure out a win-win for everybody. And And if it was, what has been painted in in the media um we wouldn't be sitting at the table our union would have won right they we would have stopped there if that that that's the narrative that's going on but but the reality is everybody's at the table trying to figure this out yeah um, yeah so i remember the days when uh, i would go to a board meeting and there'd be 20 people in the audience and we'd go okay or that's not the case anymore it does seem to be a problem for you guys to have nobody attending your board meetings anymore it's an interesting, interesting statement, uh, Don, um, because you're right. We we don't have. Uh, I think we had a parent show up to one of our uh, board meetings a week or so ago. It was the first visitor we had at a board meeting um, since really the started. But what's interesting is because we have had to go to this, we've had to broadcast a lot of our right. board meetings. Right. And I think uh, at, at our last board meeting that we had when the decision was made to go back five days a week, we had over 800 people on wow. uh, watching uh, the board meeting take place. So I think the community engagement um, has been much higher with our board than, right. and then probably any time, at least in my career. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, think it's been, I, I think it's been good for us um, and, and I think it, the other thing that I want to compliment is uh, there's no question that our communities care about their schools. There is zero question about that. No matter whether you're happy with us or unhappy with us, they, they are engaged in what's happening, right? So, you know, I mean, that's a change. It really is. In, in my career, I mean, there were times when we did a calendar change when there was, there was a few other oh well, students come first when we got some participation but really in general um it was like i don't want to go to a board meeting that's boring blah 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 but the issues now have peaked no doubt the community's interest and in, and you've really got active participation i mean it's a double-edged sword right well, it's no question it's a double-edged sword. Um, but but I think that, you know, one of the things that, and I know CUNA is the same way, and, and that is um, we try and be transparent about what we're trying to do. Um, Wendy talked about the um, the committee that, that her, her uh, district's going through. We did the same process mm -hmm. as we started going through this as well. You bring the parents and the kid and and the teachers and the administrators, both school level and central office level, and board members together to try and find solutions. And 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 it's through those conversations that I think you continue to build the trust with the community because they know what you're trying to do. Um, now, if you don't like the decision, then you always attack the process. But but the, the reality of it is, it's. Um, you know, when you have a culture of being transparent about what you do, then I think that people can live with the decision as long as their voice was heard. And I think that's the key to, to what we've been going through lately is, is giving people's voice, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, that we get, that people get to own their voice and that we're listening to them. Right. Um, it doesn't mean you get to get your way. It means we have to, we have a responsibility to listen to people and their decisions. And again, to go back to what we talked about, that's what may, has made this hard is 50% think you need to do this and 50% think you need to do that. And, but, but you have to have a process in place that allows for those voices to be heard. Wendy? Um, I think the question originally was around board attendance and participation. I, I actually am excited about it, and I hope that we can continue to, to 
tap into that. You know, um, there's been some technologies, of course, that have helped make that happen um, easier so that people can attend from, you know, their home and still participate. And I like that. I like that. I, I hate having a, a board meeting when there's like just the people in the room or us, you know, right. this is the whole reason for a board meeting is it's a public meeting, you know? So I, I'm hoping that when we're kind of through this challenge, that the engagement continues um, just as, as excited about it, whether or not they're going to, we're going to reopen, um, to in-person learning, you know, when that's going to happen. Um, I want that same level of engagement when we're talking about, um, uh, what do we do about, um, our, you know, reading, you know, challenges. What are, I want the same engagement as, right. Uh, what are we going to do? What what next program are we going to add within the current technical education? So, I I hope that we've made it easier for people to participate and and not just this temporary time of engagement. I, we need that engagement to get to make sure we're meeting the needs of the community that right. they and the hopes and dreams that they have for their children, but also so the community can hear some of our challenges and maybe help us, you know, with with some of those so that we're not isolated because we I do believe we reflect the the desires of the community that we serve so um, I know in the past it's been hard for that to be realized always but um, I, I think we're going to have more engagement I really do predict that and I'm, I'm excited about that yeah I think that would be a positive so you said something there uh, Wendy with regard to uh, reading or or you know, learning math or whatever. So let's hypothetically say we fast forward to August and the kids are coming back to school. And, you know, regardless of where we are this spring, you're all in uh, full, you know, every, all the kids are back. And everybody's worried about, well, wait a minute, there's been all this loss of opportunity for learning. And, and what are you going to do about that? And so what are you going to do about that? Well, the kids are going to show up and then, then what are they, do you move them around in grades or do you, what do you do? Um, you know, we, we know what we're doing. We're professionals in the school district and in, in every school district. We regularly see children, um, you know, whether they're coming from another district or whether they're coming to us due to school, whatever, we have benchmarks where we think kids should be, right? They're fairly arbitrary, to be honest. You know, it, they're, they're dependent upon, um, maybe some curriculum expectations that we've established, um, it, you know, like it, by first grade, they need to know X, Y, and Z so that they can be ready for second grade. Right. But we regularly see kids just in a typical year that didn't meet those benchmarks from f in first grade when they showed up to second grade. And we have professionals that meet and they figure that out. They design a plan. We call them intervention plans often. It's, it, it sounds scarier than it is, but, but really develop plans to help kids um, get the learning that they need in order to um, benefit from what the new content that's happening. But I guess I would look at this a little bit different. I, I, I've even had to get myself here because I've been like panicked about learning loss and not that I'm, I'm always panicked about that. I mean, that's my job is to make sure kids learn at high levels. Mm -hmm. But um, Kobe said the word lifelong learning. And, you know, they're really, when a child learns something, when any of us learn something, we don't lose it. It's there. We may have to rekindle it. We may have to reconnect, review. Um, but, but I don't want us to see that this year was all about loss. I think there's a whole bunch of things that kids gained. Um, I think about, you know, Kobe spoke eloquently about all the things our teachers learned. Kids learned some pretty amazing things too during this time. Um, and, and some of them aren't going to be measured in a test necessarily. But, but I, I would just look at this as, you know, if, if I'm a parent, I'm going to want to know, right, where, what can I do to help my child? Mm -hmm. Where, what are the things that maybe my child is behind on? And when I say behind, I'm talking about what they may need to be in that next grade. So I'm a first grade student going to second grade. Maybe I didn't, um, you know, one of the things we've been worried about is, you know, some of the 
um, fine motor, motor skills that you, you we really focus on in the, in the early grades, maybe didn't have as much time to write with a pencil, you know, or a pen. Um, but we, we can get a plan and we will create a plan to make sure that child is ready to benefit. Um, and I know that sounds overly simplistic, but um, I think the bigger issue for us when it comes from a resource side of thing, and this is where I hope this state um, focuses their time and energy is not on what the loss, but it's the level, it's the amount maybe of, of support that we had, you know, maybe we'd have 15% of our kids that were constantly kind of working to kind of catch up. Um, but we may have more students that, that are in that situation, but I have no doubt that we'll get them there. Um, I, I think when we, we also talk about learning loss. We talk about, especially at the upper grades, we talk about experiences that kids may have missed out on. Yeah. Um, and, and those are things that, uh, again, they may have lost some of those experiences, but I know when they return, we're going to work like crazy to, to figure out how to um, compensate for that and, and get kids to where they need to get. Um, one of our biggest challenges right now is um, in the secondary is, um, the certifications that kids can earn through career and technical education courses. And so um, we're behind kind of where our goal is, but we also know that why does it just stop when, you know, it's June 3rd, you know, we, we, we might need to think about extending some of these opportunities that we haven't maybe done in the past because we've learned all, all sorts of things. So that's a very long answer, but, but I, ho I hope it just, I guess my, my overall answer is that I, I don't want parents to panic. Um, we have professionals that will help partner. And, and if a child is behind, they're not ready for their next step quite yet in certain areas, we're going to fill that gap. We're going to help you do that. That's our job. Yeah, if I could just piggyback on, on some things that Wendy just said there. I, I think that she was very insightful a lot of a lot of the things that she said um you know when i think one of the things that's important and it may go back to a point i talked about earlier about managing fear through this um there's a fear that my kid isn't going to be ready for and fill in the blank he's behind yeah um and 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 i that's a very real fear and 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 so i want to acknowledge the fact that that um that we have a responsibility to articulate how we're going to deal with some of these things for our families um so so let me let me try and give some examples of what i'm talking about number one i don't think it's a that we can can continue to compare this year's and i'm just going to use fifth grade as an example fifth grade to last year's fifth grade um, and and, I'm, and I'll use an analogy that maybe it maybe works, maybe it doesn't work, but it's like trying to compare air travel pre 9-11 to air travel post 9-11. There's been an event in between there that has significantly changed how we do things. And so it's it's not a fair comparison to be looking at last year versus this year. We have to start thinking about how we move forward post pandemic. Um, and, and so let me give you an, a, another example of what I'm talking about. We have to get hyper-focused on our standards in the state of Idaho, hyper-focused. So an example is um, one of the examples in, in, uh, of a standard in English in ninth grade is the site um, through strong thorough textual evidence to support an analysis of a text. Now that's a lot of fancy words that mean a kid goes in, reads a te some uh, text or passage, and then from that can pull evidence to support a position. That's a law. Uh, that's a lifelong skill that translates no matter if you're reading an English book or if you are in a job at Micron. You have to be able to read text and pull evidence out of that text. We have typically over the years taught that standard through reading To Kill a Mockingbird. So I'm trying to give a real concrete example. Sure. Okay, so 
we, we teach that through reading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Well, to, to read that kind of a text in a classroom takes several weeks to do that. But the skill you get from reading it is what we're trying to get after. So as a school district, we will be able to change the text that the kid reads and still develop the skills that they need to move forward. So we need to stop getting focused on whether or not we read To Kill a Mockingbird and start getting focused on can my kid read some text and pull evidence out of that? That may be a too technical an answer, but I'm trying to make the point that we can do this if we get focused on the standards rather than the the the, the novel of To Kill a Mockingbird. No, I think that's a great point. So what, what you're basically saying is that the level of complexity of the text might not be as important as being able to accomplish that standard with a group of students. And it's the standard that is what prepares kids post graduation. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. not the it's not whether or not they can name the characters in To Kill a Mockingbird. That's not the skill we're after. Mm -hmm. I can do that. By the way. <laughs> I, know, I know you can. I know you can. <laughs> I was going to commend Kobe for being a math teacher yeah. and talking about yeah, right? the standard. I'm really impressed. I, 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 again, I've tried to learn some things through this process as well. <laughs> well that's Wendy, the English teacher, talking to you too, right? <laughs> But it's so true, you know, I mean, if you go to Micron and you're reading a technical manual, you have to do some of that same analysis and, and take things out of it to be able to, to write a summary or to, you know, operate whatever you're supposed to do. Um, so it does apply across the board. Fast, that's fascinating discussion, you guys. I really do appreciate it. And by the way, while you were talking, I think I generated 50 more questions. <laughs> that I want to ask you. Um, we, we've got just a few minutes left. Um, so let's just let's just finish this way. What gives you hope? What gives you hope for the future? What are you excited about? Um, and, and let's just leave it at that. Why don't you go ahead and just talk about, you know, the, those things that that you're looking forward to in the future? You want me to start, Wendy? Sure. <laughs> um, Number one, um, and, 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 and this may seem very, very um, specific, but the vaccine gives me hope. Um, and and, and I, I think it's important for, for our audience to know that, you know, we at 83 percent of our staff has gotten at least one shot of the vaccine. Wow. It's awesome. That's a high percentage. And Kobe apparently just froze. So. Wendy? I'll, I'll say um, <laughs> kids and teachers give me hope. Um, I was in a kindergarten classroom this morning, and they don't know there's a pandemic going on, right? <laughs> Other than they have masks on, and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're there to learn. And I think when we get all of this crazy stuff, what I do when I get to that point is I go and see children. I go see them working with their teachers. That's what gives me hope. Yeah. Oh, you Am I back? Continue. Yeah. Yeah, you're back. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Um, so yeah, uh, to, to piggyback from what Wendy just said, that that is exactly what gives me hope as well. I, I get I, I I get hopeful when I see um, how dedicated our staff has been. Um, I get hope to to go back to a point that Wendy made earlier about the kindness that our community and the grace that our community has shown through this. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I think we're a better district today than we were a year ago. That gives me hope. Yep. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. So, um, you know, I wrote down, I want to talk about CTE and I want to talk about advanced placement. I want to talk about legislation that's coming up and I want to delve further into the learning loss stuff. Um, I wanted, to, I wanted you to talk about what you miss in the classroom. I want to talk about what budgets are going to look like. So we have to do another episode, you guys, because <laughs> there's so much more to talk about. And I think that people are really going to be interested in hearing more uh, from you as educators. And and even, you know, I know you miss the classroom. And, and Wendy, you were talking about it there for a second. But, but really what I want to say right now is just thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us. I think people are going to be really interested 
in hearing from uh, the experts in education about educational issues. So thank you. Thank you, Don. Really appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Great fun. Bye. Bye.